tonight, turn to the book of Haggai. We'll be looking at the book of Haggai tonight, really digging into that book. Um, And if you have a fancy Bible and it has a second marker, you can set your marker in Ezra chapter 4 as well. Uh, So we'll be looking at Ezra and Haggai as well. Um, A couple months back, um, I think it was quarter before last, the uh, small auditorium and then the large auditorium did the Minor Prophets. Um, and the book of Haggai really stuck out to me. It had a lot of very applicable points and things that we can take into our own lives today um, and really apply to our own lives uh, to use, um, and especially working through perseverance, working, working through times of trial and also times of growth. And that's what I want to talk about tonight and just go over um, The book has a lot of benefit, too, for those that are feeling discouraged, feeling weak. The people, um, the children that were coming back into the land were coming from uh, a land that wasn't theirs, uh, a people that was ruling over them, and they come back to their own land, and it's in shambles, and they have to build back. Um, Oftentimes in the church, sometimes there are people that are struggling, and we just don't know about We know about the people that are struggling to to come to church anyway. Um, But oftentimes we have people here feeling weak, feeling distant from the Lord. Uh, And this lesson has a lot of applicable applicable points to you as well. Um, So please uh, take those to heart, uh, meditate on those. But we'll be looking in the the book of Haggai tonight. So to to set the background, and we've talked about this book before, but I really want to set the background because it really helps us, especially with the first point, understand what's going on. Uh, In verse 1 of Haggai, it says, In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel. We'll stop there. The the setting here we have is the first and second year of Darius uh, the king of Persia. We have a lot going on here, and they're returning from captivity, and we have a good background here in Ezra chapter 4. Uh, turn there with me, if you will. Ezra chapter 4 and verse 1. We'll be coming back to Haggai, obviously, in a second. But looking at Ezra chapter 4, um, throughout the whole uh, chapters 4 verse 6 really gives us a good picture of what's going on here. But for the sake of time, we're just going to read a section of it. But chapter 4 verse 1, it says, Now when the adversaries of Judah... And Benjamin heard that the returned exiles were building a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel. They approached Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's houses and said to them, Let us build with you, for we worship your God as you do, and we have been sacrificing to him ever since the days of Irshadon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and the rest of the heads of the father's houses in Israel said to them, You have nothing to do with us in the building of this house to our God. But we alone will build to the Lord, the God of Israel, as the king Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. And the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build and bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, the king of Persia. And in the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. We'll stop there for now. Uh, But this first little part, we have um, basically the future Samaritans come into the land, come into these people, and and offer to to work and to build with them. But they said, you have no part with us. Uh, They get a little offended by that, and they start to discourage the work that that they have here. And we see a little bit of the result, verse down to verse uh, 11. They write a letter. Chapter 4, verse 11, it says, This is a copy of the letter that they sent to Artaxerxes the king, your servants, the men of the province beyond the river. Send greeting, and now let it be known to the king that the Jews who came up from you to us have gone to Jerusalem. They are rebuilding that rebellious and wicked city. They are finishing the walls and repairing the foundations. Now be it known to the king that if this city is rebuilt and the walls finished, they will not pay tribute, custom, or toll, and the royal revenue will be impaired. Now, because we eat the salt to the palace, and it is uh, not fitting for us to witness the king's dishonor, therefore we send and inform the king, in order that the the search may be made in the book of the records of your fathers. You will find the book of the records and learn that the city is a rebellious city, hurtful to kings and provinces, and that sedition was stirred up in it from old. 
That is why the city was laid waste. We make known to the king that if this city is rebuilt and its walls finished, you will then have no possession in the province beyond the river. Um, and we see the result here. The people um, that were rebellious uh, to the children of Israel at the time uh, write a letter, uh, write a letter uh, basically just talking bad about them, uh, saying they're rebellious, they're going to just totally turn their backs on you, not pay taxes once this wall is built. Um, misinforming the king and uh, really causing some trouble for them. In Ezra chapter 4 and verse 21, at the end of this chapter, uh, we see the response from the king, and it's not a good one. The king says, Therefore make a decree that these men be made to cease, and that this city be not rebuilt until a decree is made by me. And take care not to be slack in this matter. Why should damage grow to hurt the king? Then when the copy of Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rahum and Shimshai, the scribe and their associates, they went in haste to the Jews at Jerusalem, and by force and power made them cease. And the work on the house of God that is Jerusalem stopped, and it ceased until the second year of the reign of Darius, the king of Persia. So this is the story. This is the setup to the book of Haggai completely, and it gives us a lot of background uh, for us to use to make some points as we go along. So what we have here happen is that the building started, the people were zealous for it, they start rebuilding the temple, opposition comes in, uh, people that weren't part of the Jews come in uh, to say, hey, let's build two. They say, no, we're not going to let you have any part of this, and they basically do work, lie to the king, and the king makes the, the work stop. Uh, so that's our background, that's what we see, and that's where we come to in Haggai chapter 1, and you can turn back there now. Um, Haggai chapter 1 really gives us the context for this. Chapter 1 and verse 1. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. And the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in paneled houses? While this house lies in ruins. Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much, you have harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them in a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house, that I may take pleasure in it. And that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. Um, his, his appeal to them and his rebuke is, re, get your focus back on me. Renew your focus to the Lord. And, and the book of Ezra really gives us the context here. Prior to reading this, I really thought that what was going on was this people was selfish. These people were focused on their own houses, focused on their own buildings, their own lives. And they didn't even think about the Lord. It never crossed their mind once. But I really think the message that we can take is perseverance. Because they were, they were thoughtful to the Lord. They were, they were thinking about Him. And they were really building the building. But then opposition comes in. Somebody comes in uh, to speak against them. And then the work stops. But we see in verses 2 through 9, God doesn't see this as an excuse. He doesn't see this and say, oh, earthly king told you to stop doing it. Okay, I understand. It's, it's fine. Don't worry about it. The earthly king said to stop. Not a big deal. He doesn't say that. The people stopped working, and this was an issue for God. So he tells them, hey, you need to get back to building the house of God. Get back to doing my work. And I really love uh, what he says here. It's God pulling back blessings because of this, but it really applies to our life today. Uh, in verse 5, it says, Consider your ways. You have sown much, you have harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them in a bag with holes. Uh, he tells these people, You've done a lot of work. 
you've sown much. You've, you've tried to, to put the work into the ground to get something out, but you've gotten nothing. You may eat, but you're not going to be filled. You can indulge yourself all you want. You, you can fill yourself with whatever you want, not just food, but any kind of media uh, to try and distract yourself. So you're not going to be able to do it. You can drink. You can find distractions. You can find some way to distract your life from the thing that's missing in your life. But you're never going to find it. You may put on more clothes. You may buy more things. You may get things in your life to make yourself feel better in the moment. But it's never going to come to anything. And the last one, you can earn as much wages as you want. You can make as much money as you want, um, but it says he does so to put them in a bag filled with holes. You guys know as much as I do, when you make money, you spend it. So there's never going to be happiness that comes from the more accumulation of money, because uh, you, you're going to put something into a bill. You're going to put something into a mortgage. You're going to put something into uh, to where the money that you take in is not going to be the money that you're in, ending up with. You're not going to be happy from that's what he's telling the people here. And as we look at the points that he makes, isn't that the same thing we try to do in our own lives? When we get away from God, when we get distant from God, when we uh, just take him out of our lives completely, when we don't build the spiritual house of God in our own lives, we're going to try and find fulfillment in something else. But it's never going to give us that. So he says, consider your ways. Um, I have a footnote in one of my other Bibles that says, set your heart upon your ways. I think he's saying, do some soul searching here. And that's what I want us to do tonight, too. Consider your ways. When opposition arises for you yourself, when you come into some spiritual work that you know you need to do, you see opposition from it. Do you cease the work? Uh, he's, uh, Paul is appealing to Timothy in 2 Timothy to resist just that. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, turn there for me. Chapter 2 and verse 8. It says, Remember Jesus Christ, the ultimate perseverer, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Jesus Christ with eternal glory. This saying is trustworthy. For if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, he will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. And we, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. God's always going to be there for us. And I think that's the most interesting part of that about that passage. There's a lot about endurance. But God will always remain there. And that's the example that we need to follow, too. To always persevere. Uh, he's appealing to Timothy. Paul is, at the end of his life, gone through all this suffering. He says, you know, I'm going to keep going. Even if we're unfaithful, God's going to be faithful to us. So we need to have that same mentality. Follow that same example. Uh, and push through. Um, we may face rejection. We may face persecution. Uh, as we talked with, with Darren's uh, sermon this morning, it, it kind of pales in comparison to what we read about that happened uh, in the first year. Uh, but we face persecution of its own t kind here today. Um, do we fear man's punishment? Maybe we've just lost some expectations in our life. Maybe we come into a part in our life that we have a lot of expectations for, or we come into a part of our spiritual life that we have a lot of expectations for. Maybe it's not as easy, maybe it's harder, or maybe we're not getting what we want out of it. Do we lose that zeal there? We see the king commanded the people to stop, but in that time they forgot about the true king in their life. And that's the same thing we do. We focus so much on what the government can do to us, the impacts that the government can have upon our lives. But they're not the true king in our lives. There's a lot that can happen, but as long as we keep our hope in God, he will always remain faithful. Um, we see, too, the results of the work in Ezra chapter 5. Ezra chapter 5, we see what kind of happens here and the results of all this. Turn back there for me. Ezra 
to chapter 5 and verse 1. We'll read verse 1 through 8. Now the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Edo, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of God the Israel who was over them. So this is actually just like the story part of the book of Haggai, which I think is, is kind of just a cool aside. Uh, verse 2, then Zerubbabel, the, the leader of this, this work, the son of Shealtiel and the Jeshua, the son of Jehozadak, arose and began to rebuild the house of God that is in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. At the same time, Tatanai, the governor of the province beyond the river, and Sher uh, Bozani and their associates came to them and spoke to them thus, Who gave you the decree to build the house and to finish this structure? And they also asked them this, What are the names of the men who are building this building? But the eye of God was on the elders of the Jews, and they did not stop them until the report should reach Darius, and then an answer be returned by a letter concerning him. This is the copy of the letter that Tatanai, the governor of the province beyond the river, and Shithar, Bozani, and his associates, the governor who were in the province beyond the river, sent. They sent a report in which was written as follows, To Darius the king, all peace, be it known to the king, that we went to the province of Judah, to all the house of the great God. It is being built with huge stones and timber, it is laid in the walls. The work goes on diligently and prospers in their hands. We see an interesting flip here. The people start working without any of Darius' um, consent. They just start working because God commanded it. And I, I love it in verse 2. In verse 2 it says, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Jehozadak, arose and began to rebuild the house that is in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. It's just a little aside, a little point. But when you decide to persevere, there will be others supporting you too. There will be other people supporting you uh, in the work that you do. Uh, we, we won't read it for the sake of time, but Darius sees this letter that they send to him, and he actually goes back and looks into the decrees, into the laws and the rules from prior kings, and he sees the command that Cyrus gives to actually rebuild the temple. He sees, hey, I was kind of wrong here. Uh, and he, he works it back, and the people are able to, to continue rebuilding. So just put, push through the struggle. I always thought that this was just about being selfish. I always thought that the people were solely selfish, didn't think of anything. Uh, and that may be true. There may be some part of that. But a lot of what's going on here is the people that just succumb to disappointment. They succumb to opposition, discouraging them from the work that they were doing. Don't do that yourself in your own life. Um, do like Timothy. Do like Paul. Persevere and be faithful like God. And the next thing, uh, turn back to Ezra chapter 3, the next point that I want to make. You're already in 5, turn back to Ezra chapter 3. Ezra chapter 3, verse 10. The rebuilding of the temple is starting. We're kind of backtracking a little bit chronologically. In verse 10 it says, And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments came forward with trumpets, and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord, according to the directions of David, the king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to God. For he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and the head of the, of the father's houses, old men who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid. Though many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted with a great shout, and the sound was heard far away. Take that. Uh, let's also turn uh, back to Haggai. And then we're going to read uh, Haggai chapter 2. Haggai chapter 2, verse 1. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month. So we have a little bit of the work going on. Uh, there are a couple of weeks in. The word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people, and say... 
Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? We'll stop there. We'll stop there for now. Uh, so basically what's going on, the people that were there before, that were there, there before the captivity saw the foundations of the temple being started. Probably saw the size, they saw the majesty, they saw what was going on, and they weeped for the former glory. They saw what was there, what they had now in front of them. They looked back to the past, comparing it to what they had back then. And then back in Haggai, we have a little bit of time passes, uh, and the same message is given. Is it not, as nothing in your eyes? Uh, these people are realizing that the glory they have now is not as good as what they had before. Uh, but he has an admonition for them. In verse 4, it says, Yet now be strong. As Robable declares the Lord, be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts, according to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit remains in your midst. Fear not, for thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more, in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, so that the treasures of all nations shall come in. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. Um, I have Joshua 1 up there. It's not a typo. It sounds so similar uh, to Joshua chapter 1. He's speaking to Joshua, who's a leader of the people of the time. He says, get into the land, go in, take it, be strong, for I am with you. And he says this to the people as well. Um, in a similar situation, they're coming back into the land. Uh, there's not any conquest to be done, but there's work to be done. And so he's promising a greater glory than before in verse, verse 9. He's promising that, and he's encouraging the people. He says, be strong, for I am with you, because they saw the former glory. They saw what they had physically beforehand, comparing it to what they have now. And they're discouraged. They're down in the dumps because of what they had before. Verse 9, 2 reveals Jesus in prophecy. It reveals Jesus coming. Uh, the latter glory of the house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace. He's saying the glory of this house is nothing compared to what I'm bringing about later. So he's saying this to the people, um, and he's encouraging them. Oftentimes, we've experienced opposition. Next comes the discouragement. And that happens. That happens in life, and that happens. Maybe we feel insignificant. Maybe we look at the, the current glory of the house. We compare it to what happened before. We compare it to the amount of people we had at scenes. We compare it to the size of the, God, the, the church building. Um, I've been in places with small congregations, small numbers. It's a blessing to have the amount that we have here. It can be often discouraging, feeling insignificant. But what he tells the people here, and the admonition for us today, too, is focus on the spiritual. Not on the physical. I mean, the temple of the Lord was the thing that they focused on. That's what they talked about in Jeremiah. They said, God's not going to put us in captivity. Look at the temple. We've got the temple here. Why would he put us in captivity when we have the temple here? That's the house of God. What's God going to do if we're not here? That was their glory. The physical structure. It can be discouraging at times when we look at the, the physical things in our life. But they don't pale in comparison to the plan that God has for us. Just like the plans had a greater, the Jews had a greater glory, um, God also has a greater glory too. Um, we're going to turn to Jeremiah chapter 29. This is one of the more misused verses in the Bible. But I think here it applies very well. Jeremiah chapter 29. Chapters 29 and 30 of Jeremiah are, are just really beautiful uh, in the plan that God has for the people. Um, it has some of the more iconic verses that we think about. 29 and verse 11. I'll actually start in verse 10. It says, For thus says the Lord, When seventy years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise, and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me, and when you seek me when you, with all your heart. 
I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all nations and all places where I've driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. So he's telling the people here in Jeremiah, I'm with you. I've got plans for you in this life. And, and here specifically, he's talking about the plans to get them back from captivity, which we see fulfilled in Haggai and Ezra. And God's got greater plans for them. He's got greater plans for us, too. But if we look at the plans that he had for Jerusalem and Haggai, he says the latter glory is going to be greater than what you have even now. They couldn't imagine what was going to be coming. They couldn't imagine Jesus. They had the prophecies, obviously, but they couldn't imagine the full breadth of salvation that we see in the New Testament. And in the same way, they've got, God's got a lot more plans for us than we can think of. Um, and so with discouragement, it, it's going to come. Oftentimes it comes with trials. Now, the admonition I have for you is just look to the plan that God has given people in the book, in the Bible, and use that. Say, God has a plan for me as well uh, to get through this discouragement. The last lesson, or the last uh, point I want to leave you with is in the chapter 2 of Haggai as well. Uh, chapter 2 of Haggai, he's kind of giving some final um, comments to the people, some final thoughts. And it kind of is a strange lesson that he gives here, at least at first. It makes sense. Uh, but he starts off with some strange questions. Haggai chapter 2, verses 10 uh, through 19. Um, we're going to read 10 through 13 right now. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the, key, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts, ask the priests about the law. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any other kind of food, does it become holy? The priest answered and said, no. And then Haggai said, if someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? And the priest answered and said, it does become unclean. Then Haggai said, so it is with this people and with this nation before me. Declares the Lord. So he, he goes into this point that he's, he makes. He basically gives them an example of holy meat touching something else. Does it become holy? So he makes a point. Sanctified meat cannot make something else clean. You can't take something that's holy and make the other thing holy. And then he gives the other point. A man with an unclean body touches something that is holy. Is that going to defile him? They say, of course. That's what the Old Testament was about, right? That's what the Old Law was about. Don't go near this. Don't do this. Because it will make you unclean. And then he makes the point, so is this people. He's saying this people is only going to get more and more unclean. When I look at this people, that's all I see. In verse 14 it says, so it is with the people... So it is with the nation, and so it is with every work of their hands. I just imagine God looking down on the people uh, and him just seeing a lot of dirt. Um, just a lot of pigs rolling in dirt. A lot of two-year-olds making mud pies. He can only see a nation that is defiled. Idolatry, sexual immorality, pride, you name it. He sees a people that is unclean. And what's more, even worse, he sees a people with no way to become holy. I think that's what we see here. He says, this people can't become holy. You can't take sanctified meat and have it touch something else and make it holy. That's not what's going on here. Verses 15 and 17. He makes the point. And we'll read it. It says, Now then, consider from this day onward, before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? When one came upon to a heap of twenty measures, there were but ten. When one came to the wine vat to draw fifty measures, there were but twenty. I struck you and all the products of your toil, with blight and with mildew and with hail. Yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. Consider now from this day onward, 
from the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, is seed yet in the barn? Indeed. The vine tree, the fig tree, and the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing. And he says, but from this day on, I will bless you. He tells his people, from now on, verse 19, from now on, I will bless you. They were a defiled people. They were completely unclean. And he makes the point before that they were completely unclean. So what's different? They rebuilt the temple of the Lord. They refocused their mind on the God. They dedicated themselves wholly to him. They desired the Lord. That's what was different here. When they laid the stone on the temple, when they started building back, that's when the Lord God blessed them. Uh, he doesn't have delight in sacrifices. We see that in, I think, Psalms chapter 40. He doesn't delight in sacrifices. He delights in someone that sets their heart on him. And that's what's different. We have one major advantage compared to these people. One major advantage that they don't have that they never had. In Haggai chapter 2, God looked on a defiled people with zero way to sanctification. Zero way to true sanctification. You had lots of sacrifices. You had lots of ways uh, to, to stave off your sin. And it really was more for them than it was for him. Because in, in Psalm 40, he, he doesn't delight in sacrifice. He doesn't see a sacrificed lamb and get excited. I think it's a lesson for the people. It's a lesson for the people to see the impact of their sin. But there was no path to sanctification in the Old Testament. The people that rebuilt the, the, the temple, they received a blessing from God but because of their dedication. But we see that we have a major advantage compared to them. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, turn there with me. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor the revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Sounds a lot like Haggai 2. You guys are defiled people before me. Verse 11, And such were, past tense, some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of, of God. That major advantage that we have above the people in Haggai, we can actually be washed from our sins. He looks on us to bless us, just like he did in Haggai. He doesn't see a defiled people. He sees a people sanctified. These people were all these things. They were washed. They were sanctified. And they were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. They didn't have sin on their record. There was nothing left behind for them. God provided them blessings. How much more will he bless us when he is able to look down upon this church, look down upon each individual soul and see a holy person, sanctified, cleansed before the Lord, ready to do his work. So not only do we have somebody that's dedicating their life to rebuilding the house of God in their own life, we have a people that is sanctified before him. God's so happy with that. We're happy with that too. Um, and that's what we want for everyone here. Um, so the lesson is your t yours tonight. Just some points to take home for yourself. You may face opposition. You may face discouragement. It may come from so many different areas. And it may seem small. It may come from somebody rejecting you. It may come from uh, persecution in whatever way it comes. Maybe it comes from you uh, just facing discouragement from lost expectations. Persevere through it. Just like Paul told Timothy to be faithful. But maybe you've fallen in that way. What areas in your spiritual life have been left undone? Maybe you've got paneled houses. Maybe you've got a physical house at home that looks really nice. But the spiritual house that you are building for the Lord 
is in shambles. Maybe you started working on it before, but you got discouraged from that work. I also want you to be encouraged. Look at the spiritual things in your life. Look at the plans that God has for you that we can read about in the Word of God. We don't have to be in mystery about it. In some ways, we can see the future in that way. We can look at the plan that God has put out for us by the examples of Paul and Peter and even Jesus to see the path that's laid out for us if we follow him. And above those, both of those points, realize we have an overwhelming blessing in Jesus Christ. We have a blessing that nobody else has had prior to Jesus dying on the cross. We had more time prior to that than we have today. We've got so many blessings in Jesus Christ. Um, take that. Use that as encouragement for your life. Use that as motivation to persevere through trials. Um, we have an overwhelming blessing in Jesus Christ. We can have our sins completely washed away and cleansed. One more verse, and I just want you to listen to it. Um, I've seen a lot of times, if I just listen to a passage, it really helps me to absorb what's being said. Sometimes when I'm reading it, at the same time somebody's saying it, it just gives me trouble. Hebrews chapter 10. I'm going to read it for you, and the lesson will be yours. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse uh, 10. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ, who had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after, he was saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on, my mind, on their minds. And then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through that curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. There's a lot of blessings in Jesus Christ that we have, a lot of spiritual blessings that we have. Reasons to be encouraged, reasons to persevere through trials, and reasons to be encouraged even though we may seem insignificant in our own eyes. Um, but there may be some people here tonight that are in the same place as the people in Haggai. They don't have sanctification. But we have an avenue to that. You all have an avenue to that. If you haven't taken advantage of that, you have uh, the opportunity to come forward or just come to someone in private. It doesn't have to be a public thing. It can just be you coming to Jesus Christ. We can help you in that way. You can receive that sanctification and be encouraged and motivated uh, to work harder in Jesus Christ. If you've maybe been working on your spiritual house and it's faced a little bit of disrepair, you can have that uh, be changed tonight. Rededicate yourself to the work of Jesus Christ. We can pray for you, we can help you, and we can encourage you. Either way, whatever we can do to help, please stand while we stand and sing.